There I haven't been working very hard this time. And we are recording. Oh. How are you guys doing tonight? I'm doing... Hey. Right. What? <laughs> <laughs> Intro music I'm only going to get to pull that joke once, yeah. Now you'll be ready for it. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I'm only going to get to do that once. <laughs> this was that one time. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll the do the introduction then. You go. Yeah, do the introduction. Okay, Nobody wants sorry. to hear my amusing anecdote. <laughs> no, I want to hear it, but hold on. Hello and welcome to Esquiring Minds, episode 10 for March 2nd, 2023. This show is three lawyer friends just chatting about random things and pulling minor pranks on each other. Uh, none of it should be taken as legal advice. Uh, I'm one of those aforementioned friends. I'm Andrew Leahy. I'm a tax and technology attorney from New Jersey. I don't know where I'm from. Uh, I'm joined, with, as always, with uh, here Jake and Jason. And Jason has an amusing anecdote. I, I had an amusing oh. anecdote, but you ruined it. I'm not going to tell lost it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. Yeah. Have I've, I built I've it up too much it. now? It's very funny. It's very funny. <laughs> Everyone no. get ready. Here it comes. No. Gosh, You're no. just withholding. Now, now it's doomed. Now it's doomed. Yeah. I am okay, it's not funny. I'm withholding. Okay. So, uh, Jake, silence. how are you doing? Awkward silence. I, I'm doing okay. <laughs> I, I'm doing okay. I do have a, a correction to previous podcasts, multiple previous podcasts. That uh, where the intro said we're goofing around for your enjoyment, the audience, we are goofing around for our own enjoyment. Uh, I just want to clarify that. Um, That's yeah. fair. If you're That's enjoying that, I then good for you. But uh, yeah, he feels nothing. Jake feels nothing. If you enjoy it or you don't, it doesn't matter. No, <laughs> he's immune to joy it's, or your joy anyway. It's for, no, it's my, for joy, my joy is the only thing that matters in this world, honestly. <laughs> Any uh, any resemblance to any joy that other people might have is purely uh, purely coincidental. Yeah. Results not yeah. typical. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Consult your doctor if you're experiencing joy while listening to Esquiring Mind. <laughs> Profes- professional driver, closed course. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, all right, all right. So how uh, are you I had doing, a brief, Jason? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I just, I had a brief re-entry into... Um, I, I might be, I'm cannibalizing our follow-ups. Uh, That's fine. But I had a brief re-entry into celebrityhood this week. Cause, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because people are this. saying things about Reedy Creek. and Or not so fake this, Reedy Creek. The setup is that, uh, I guess, I mean, I, I'm, I've just read headlines and a little bit about sort of, you know, in talking with you and stuff. But the setup is that uh, the governor mentioned wanting to sort of control some of the output of Disney through this right. new special district, right? Right. Oh so Disney, goodness. for people who haven't listened to the previous episodes, Disney uh, had a special government district called Reedy Creek until very recently where it controlled basically all the local government functions for Disney World. And uh, no longer the case as of like three days ago, two days ago. Uh, where the governor signed a bill that replaced it with a district that's basically identical, but controlled by governor's appointees. And he made some comments that maybe, you know, the members of this district might be interested in seeing more content, making sure (laughs) that Disney has more content that everyone can enjoy, is what he said. Um, Sure. Which caused a lot of questions, uh, which were directed to me. Because I made my name as a Reedy Creek expert somehow. And the questions were basically, can he do that? Uh, and the answer were always, was always, absolutely not. Is it gonna is it gonna happen anyway? Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> yep. Which is kind of the situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of the situation with the uh, Reedy Creek being taken over by the state in the first place. Like he probably he probably couldn't do the that. Can, but Disney didn't want to. Yeah, the fight can it. the can they do that? i I feel increasingly frustrated with that question i i had a question somebody asked me about um i, I wrote something a, a tax article i'm not gonna hijack it's, this comes back around i mm. promise um a tax article about uh when they released trump's tax returns and it was basically this person was like sort of diving into whether or not they the uh treasury or the department of justice had the ability to do that or the core congress had that the ability to release those and i did some research into it and i i think they probably did but more to the point they did it already so i i, I don't know well, what's going to happen now? So like somebody's <laughs> going to get slapped on the wrist. It's not going to get undone. So yeah, can yeah. they do that? Yeah, yeah, they did it. I, I, I'm reminded of like when you're in school and you would say like, can I use the bathroom? And the annoying teacher would say, well, I don't know. Can you? It, it's the same <laughs> sort of thing. Like, can they do that? Should they do that? No. Are they supposed to be able to do that? Is that how it's supposed to work? No. But can they? No. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Is yeah, I mean, that's more or less your answer here, right? 
I encounter this all the time when people are like, uh, hey, if I uh, make if I file this charge of discrimination against my employer, uh, can they fire me? Like, well, can they fire you legally? No, that's that would be illegal to fire you for making a charge of discrimination to the EEOC. But can they actually uh, like can it happen? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> by the time your EEOC charge is resolved in six months and then we file a lawsuit and that takes a year and a half at a minimum, like you've been out, out of a job for two years, like. Is that a great circumstance? No, but, but I, like yeah. applying that same principle to Disney, like can the, the district, can Ron DeSantis's, uh, whether himself or through his cronies who are now in the, whatever the reformed Reedy Creek district is called, can they legislate that Disney can not include any wokeness in their movie? There has to be a minimum threshold. Of, <laughs> you must have, oh, you must have. 80, 85% uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants uh, as the cast of your <laughs> animated movies. Uh, can they legislate that? Yeah, sure. Can they stop, practically stop Disney from publishing that to movie theaters or to Disney Plus? Like, no, no, they can't do that. I yeah. Mean, practically, they can legislate it. And uh, that legislation will surely be struck down in five years when it finally reaches the Supreme Court. Yeah, one thing I, you know, the the question of whether or not they can control Marvel movies is a little different than like, can they just ruin Disney World? Because they, you know, there's legal problems with what the, with maybe the more severe actions that Central Florida Tourism Board could do in response to Disney content when it comes to Disney World. But the idea of them controlling Marvel movies, that's getting to the point where, they can pass whatever what whatever they want, and Disney like almost doesn't even need to go to court because they can just ignore them. Like they control local laws in this little district. The Disney can put out whatever movie it wants. It's so outside of the geographical geographic literal purview of the district. So I don't well, even. I mean, it's my so guess was. Fail. My assumption, I guess, was that it would be some sort of retaliation if Disney. I mean, all of the none of this is legal. I'm certain of it, and it wouldn't stand up. But my assumption was that the way it would work would be um, they would say something like, "We sure wouldn't like you to put out a movie that has, you know, beyond uh, a six on the woke scale, uh, a scale of you know out of ten. And if you do, we will. I, I don't know something in that local district is my assumption because yeah, I, I I didn't even imagine yeah. that they would just like pass a bill that is applicable only in that little district that says like, yeah, no, no more woke movies because right. yeah, Disney would just ignore it. Well, okay. We don't even produce, <laughs> do they even do anything in with filmmaking at yeah. Disney world in Florida? Is that I even where their studios are? They do a mm. lot of guests. Uh, they do a lot of special episodes of ABC shows. I don't right. they do that <laughs> where, yeah. where members of sitcom families go to spend a day at Disney world. I've seen maybe six or seven of those. Right. Um, but yeah, it's so it's so beyond the realm of possibility. I think you're right. That's kind of, and I think you're right, Andrew. Like that's kind of the more soft control that I think is very like is very possible. Um, right. But also like doesn't create headlines because it's all the second it's stated is the second that Disney has a cause of action against it. So right. it has to be implicit, and if it's implicit, right. it's not that interesting. And if it's not that interesting, then it's not a win for people who want Anyone. that win. And so there's no point in doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, and as if long it's as it subtle, stays, then... yeah, as long as it stays what, <laughs> as long as it stays subtle, then it, and, and yeah. it stays like the mob boss subtle, uh, where it's like, oh, that's a <laughs> great theme park you have there. It sure would be a shame if something happened to it. Like as right. if it stays stuff like that, uh, then. You know, that may be a little less subtle than is, is required, but uh, if you keep it low key, like I, it's harder and harder to make those connections. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I think that's, I think that's very likely to happen even on a subconscious level. Like, right. That's the thing. Like I, uh, you know, working in local government a lot, so much of what people might consider like improper influence never gets said by either party. Like they're just afraid of angering someone. So they'll just comport right. to what they think will not, af- not anger them. Yeah. It's um, the 800 pound gorilla in the room thing, right? It's like, you don't need yeah. to point to it and, and, and say that that gorilla is dangerous. Everyone right. gets it. It just has to sit there. Yeah. Like, uh, 
like I'm imagining like a zoning application. You know, one one person on that board really doesn't like Dollar General, so you don't even try to apply. You you apply using some other store or something like that. It's just like, uh, or you use the store that they have stock in or something like that. You never <laughs> even talk about it. Uh, right. You it just happens. They're so when you go in. looking for a crime later, there is no email where it's like, all right, now don't forget yeah. at the meeting. There's tomorrow, no email. There's sure. no conversation. There's no phone record. It's just big. And there's frankly, Implicit. the person maybe didn't even have bad intent and they're just trying to, you know, nobody had bad intent. They, by their very existence, created a, po- a positive result for themselves and influenced somebody else's behavior. It's like, I, I don't even know how you begin to police something like that. Yeah. Well, speaking of stuff that uh, I guess is a little bit easier to police, um, I think our main topic, I think Jason put it in, but our main topic is basically the broad idea of security and um, cell phones and technology and how maybe we need to start considering um, yeah. security in, in dealing with our devices. Was that a, was this a Jason uh, joint? Yeah, I dropped this. I dropped this in there uh, in the last couple of days. There was a... Uh, a, a kind of bomb that dropped in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it was late last week. It might have been earlier this week, uh, maybe over the weekend. Uh, but Joanna Stern, who is just a fantastic reporter, uh, does a really great yeah, work. Uh, she broke this article that is uh, kind of making waves in tech circles, and we're part of the tech circle. Uh, but uh, this is uh, a report that she did. Uh, the Wall Street Journal is behind a paywall. But I'll just give kind of a, a basic summary of what's going on here. There's a string of thefts that Joanna Stern uh, and I, there was another reporter who was involved with her, I think, uh, basically Nicole talked about this string. Wynn. Yeah, Nicole. Sorry. Wynn, thank you. Uh, they reported on this string of thefts of people's iPhones primarily. And in fact, the article focused exclusively on iPhones, although this is not a phenomenon that's unique to iPhones. We can talk about that later. Uh, where uh, if you have a security passcode on your phone, right? Like a lock code that uh, can be sped up with face ID or touch ID, but it's like a pin number, a four digit, six digit, alphanumeric, whatever. If you have your phone secured by that, which like all of us do, most all of us do at this Mm -hmm. point, uh, then uh, if somebody watches over your shoulder or has a camera that's watching you or something like that, they can get a hold. If they get a hold of your passcode and then physically get a hold of your phone, they can basically take over and ruin your life. Uh, Because all it takes to change your uh, Apple ID password or change your, what what does Google call it? A Google ID or uh, whatever to to change your Android your Google account Mm -hmm. password, all you have to do is have physical possession of the phone and be able to unlock it. And you can go into the settings menu on your phone. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how it works on an Android phone, but on an iPhone, you just click on that little section in the settings app at the very top. That's your face and uh, your basic iCloud information. And with just the passcode, you can change your Apple ID password and you can revoke your uh, logins on all of your other devices from that hmm. one device that you hold physical custody of. And uh, so far as everybody that I've listened to can tell, so far as the article indicated, and so far as the people who have been victims of this sort of attack have been able to figure out so far, there is no getting this information back. Uh, and so... Wow. In this world that we've been living in, where people have you know four digit, six digit, uh, you know lock codes on their phone, and you, you see Kanye West show up and gets caught unlocking his phone in the Oval Office while he's visiting Donald Trump years ago, and everybody in the world knows Kanye's passcode from that because it was caught on camera. He was just mashing one 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 or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now all you need to do is just like you know lift it out of Kanye's pocket, and you can control Kanye's life. So many people so, just have one, 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 one. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so this prompted in my mind, like a really big concern about we're all three lawyers, we're all three technology enthusiasts, uh, people who are really interested in the stuff, pay close attention to it. And this has just been making such a wave that like, I think about back when I was in a law firm with other people, particularly uh, people who are 
uh, perhaps generationally less inclined to be technically competent or savvy, uh, mm -hmm. they uh, they would have you know very simple lock codes, if any lock code at all on their phone. Uh, and I think about all of the insane vulnerabilities that face law firms by people who are uh, just too careless about stuff like this. Sure. As it's you were saying that, I was <clears throat> sorry. Go ahead, Jake. You go, go ahead. No, as you were saying that, I just uh, a thing I wanted to point out is I also can imagine if you were if you wanted to target only people who had uh, single digit lock codes, you know, most people use four digits, and if you just looked at the smudge on the screen itself, you could probably predict what that digit was and you would be able to get in so like there's there's another i haven't read i don't know if that was in the article i didn't see it but like mm -hmm. there's another layer to all of this too like even beyond you know we, it, it's we need to like kind of reconsider security um on multiple levels choosing better lock codes would go a long way apple doing a better job or and google too i'm sure it's the same problem doing a better job of allowing these sort of things to be undone or uh having two factor actually require two factors not having your phone be all of the factors would go a long way towards getting us there. Jake, you had something to say? Or did we lose you? I'm still here. I can I barely... <laughs> you all are going oh, in and They'll out. probably come back around. So uh, yeah. the, the, a lot of the comments that I've heard people make about this as this has been really um, kind of thoroughly in the discussion this week uh, is... There's a there's a tension to be managed here because you have competing bads that are on either side of the situation. One competing bad is uh, I forgot my uh, Apple ID password, and now if there's no way for me to change it and retrieve it that way, uh, or if the way to do it is like really really hard then you have people getting locked out of really, really important life events like right. all of their pictures that are stored in iCloud. Uh, for somebody like me, where now I'm reconsidering this, uh, for somebody like me who relies very heavily on the uh, Apple keychain password system, where all of my, yeah. not all of, but a sub very substantial portion of my username and password credentials are in my phone. Like This is a sure. thing that's happening to people where... Uh, if you have physical custody of somebody's phone and you have their uh, keypad uh, or their, what do you call it? Passcode, the, the code, PIN number. Passcode, yeah. To, right. log, to log into their phone, not only do you now have access to their phone and all of the content that's on their phone, but all of the things that are uh, you know, just behind that, because all it takes to get into the keychain, you know, keychain password manager sure. is that PIN code. Uh, right. And so now you can get my banking credentials and I'm not encouraging anybody to come mm. and get my banking credentials or anything right. like that. He has no <laughs> money. We've, we've discussed this before. He's, you, he's you're holding, you're holding all of the keys to the kingdom there, uh, such that one of the stories that was at least touched on, uh, by, uh, by this wall street journal article was like somebody lost something to the effect of like $30,000, uh, out of their bank account because of this kind of uh, this kind of attack, I guess right. is is the only real way that you can describe it. And with the latest um, iOS version, also I I don't know if you've made use of this yet, but the two factor like the generating the the code generator thing, you usually have to use Google Authenticator or Authy or one of these other authentication apps. That's built yeah. into the password manager, the keychain manager as well. So right. that really is like the the code is it because at least if you if it's you know through some third party um, code generating application sometimes I'm, I'm trying to think about Authy I think it has it sometimes it will prompt you for another separate password when you go into it in order to get access to those codes but with mm. this sort of unified behind everything is uh, you know at the OS level that code on your phone at least in the Apple ecosystem I really don't know how it works with Google is your everything you know it's only becoming more so right Did we uh, get you back Jake. Yeah, I'm. Well, I'm here. <laughs> I've been. No, I've been Jake, here. So, here. The, com used to so be. the competing no. bads that you have here is you want to be able to get yourself back in if you get locked out, but also you don't want to be able for somebody else to maliciously lock you out of the system. You right. want to be able to retrieve it and get yourself back in, uh, and uh, that's a really, really hard balance to strike here. And the thought that I had uh, about this was this is even more important for lawyers who are not just dealing with their own secret 
uh, information. But also, sure. like if you think about what's on my phone, uh, I have all of my clients' contact information. Great, that's probably pretty benign. Uh, but I also have access to all of my email, my practice right. management app, uh, my bank accounts, which include client trust accounts. Uh, and so for lawyers, this, I think, should give a, kind of an extra special level of concern for all of this because I think now we have to take a level of scrutiny to f- the physical safety of our phone devices and like the uh, fastidiousness with which we safeguard that passcode. Uh, because if you have a four digit passcode on your phone, that is. Uh, very, very comparatively easy for somebody to observe you typing in, even if they just see from the back of your phone kind of approximately where your thumb is going on the screen. Like Absolutely. you have a few attempts to try and get it right. And so if you can get the basic shape of it, like you can crack somebody's phone and seize their life and a lot of really important stuff to clients. And so I thought, especially for lawyers, there needs to be a lot of heightened awareness around this. Uh, because this story might not circulate in legal circles, uh, that's a great heightened point. awareness about it and extra like precaution taken here. Welcome back, Jake. Yeah, yeah, you're back. No, I think we're good. Sure. Yeah. You would need... Yeah, you'd need one of those external dongles. Those, I mean, I actually don't know if you could do it for an iPhone, but the um, uh, I forget the, this is a Wubi key or something like that, right? What, Jason, have you ever Yubi. heard of those? Yubi. Why Yubi key. I said yep. I said Wubi. Oh man. Yeah, and it plugs in. That's one factor. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I'm locked out. Yeah. But I mean, there there, there seems to be, you would guess that there is some sort of happy medium where like maybe you could make use of the phone for uh, some subset of features, like a sort of secure, uh, this is a term of art, so I shouldn't say secure enclave. That is something else. But I mean, like a kind of like an enclave for a certain set of applications that could be behind something more because when you were gone we were talking a little bit about how um increasingly people use the uh the built-in password manager too right so it has all your passwords oftentimes oh <laughs> right. which is what your purgatory will be it's just us talking at you for eternity until you've <laughs> atoned for whatever it is you've done in life but uh, the other thought i had is about um like with password managers in general my thought has always been like i've been waiting for the big leak of uh, a whole database of of, of like yeah. unsecured, unhashed passwords because there is something every, all your eggs in one basket about like whether it's one password or Apple's you know built in thing or LastPass or any of these. As you're doing it, you feel a little bit like oh boy, man, th- somebody gets a hold of this, they kind of have the whole thing though, don't they? And increasingly, that this is just your phone. It's not even some external thing that they have to get access to. It's just you know as Jason was saying with, with this story, it's just a you know, four digits and that's it. Right. <laughs> right. I just used my, my, my oldest child's la- first name and, yeah. 
<laughs> and then one, two, three. Right. Right. Now I'm secure. Yeah. And the only reason it's, it's at all better is because the assumption is that if you don't use one of those password managers, you're going to use a password that is not 16 random characters, you know, a combination of capitalization and numbers. Right. You're going to use something like your dog's name and, and you know, one, two, three or whatever. And so the password manager is better because it can allow you to use those uh, unique to each account and more sophisticated passwords. But I don't mm -hmm. think anyone thinks that having it all in one, like, I think the ideal would be you could just memorize, you know, a random 16 digit or 16 character password for every one of your accounts, but you can't and people aren't going to try. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> right. Here's yeah, my hack. Right. <laughs> right. Once I nailed it, I'm not going to, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you the number. I'm not an idiot. Yeah. Right. That's right. No. Yeah. My, my favorite number. I mean, I think one of the key pieces to learn here is that the the vector of the attack here isn't on any of the back end services like iCloud or Google Drive or any sort of supporting uh, software or services infrastructure here. The vulnerability is fundamentally about people having bad passcodes and bad passcode uh, uh, hygiene. Hygiene Hygiene's not the right yeah. word for it, but like uh, ba bad habits. Yeah, <laughs> bad, bad habits. Uh, yeah. And so I think this is a kind of a wake up call for a lot of us who got a little bit complacent uh, in, you know, the one of the podcasts that I was listening to that was talking about this pretty heavily uh, talked about how, uh, and I think probably all three of us are old enough to remember the time where uh, your most treasured uh, number was your ATM pin code, and uh, yeah. like you kind of you keep you keep a safe distance. No, Jake's not old enough for that. Uh, so, like, you, I have a code right now. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. Right. <laughs> Right. And like that part of that era is a little bit over the importance of ATMs and pin codes. But the notion, and maybe that's part of why we've gotten away from good uh, pin code uh, practices. But the notion here is like back then when ATMs were first getting uh, widespread and were in very, very common use back when people still used cash, uh, then uh, uh, people would really carefully guard. And like, if you're standing at the ATM, you're making sure that nobody's looking over your shoulder. Maybe you're cupping your one hand while you're over your hand that's typing in the passcode on the other. They had that little uh, mirror. It, Do you remember that little fisheye mirror that you'd look to make sure there wasn't somebody yeah. waiting to jack you with a sock full of pennies? Yeah, you can keep yeah. an eye on there. There's a camera too, I but mean, there's a little, little might mirror. Might have been that too. <laughs> uh, oh, maybe. Okay. Could be. <laughs> Could be. They would never tell you because that's bad OPSEC. But uh, so the one of the biggest and most important things is to make sure that people know about this because this is like a potentially catastrophic thing that could happen. And like, okay, you lose some money out of your bank account. You lose your pictures of your, of your family. Uh, God forbid you have uh, your client information exposed or client money exposed in this sort of situation. Yeah. Like... Uh, this is something that is worth everyone's attention to be really mindful of and, and pay some, pay some attention to, uh, it seems to me that the best practice here, since the main vector of attack here is going to be the human element of it, the human behaviors of setting a bad passcode in the first place and having bad OPSEC when it comes to putting in your passcode in those social circumstances where you might need to put in your passcode, like, it's COVID times again, and things are getting really spicy and uh, everybody's got the flu and RSV and COVID all at the same time. And so you're wearing a mask again. Maybe this is before the world where you, you, there was no face ID unlock uh, with the mask on still. Uh, but like everybody kind of, not everybody, a lot of people simplified their passcodes so that they didn't have to sure. type in big, long numbers. Uh, I did. I simplified my passcode. Uh, 
uh, it's time to not do that. And it's time to <laughs> kind of be uh, the uh, suspicious, not uh, the wary person at the ATM in 1996, who's kind of like hunching their body over the, the pin pad uh, and cupping their hand to cover the code as it's going in. Like you got to be really careful about this because of the very, very alarming consequences of somebody gets your physical phone, physical custody of your phone and knows your code, they can lock you out of everything. Mm. Yeah. 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 A lot of lawyers in that group. But Jason made a good point too, and I, I don't—I didn't see it in the article. I, I don't know if this was like your original idea, and you're out there doing this. But um, using cameras—I mean, <laughs> I know you're not out there doing this. Using a camera—that's yeah, huge. Right. I mean, if you record, you record something, you film somebody, uh, you know, using their phone, and you can be reasonably certain they're going to—maybe they are wearing a mask, and you can be reasonably certain they're going to need to type in the code. Game over, right? You got the code. Now all you have to do is wait for. I mean, I'm not trying to give tips <laughs> to people looking right. to do this, right? <laughs> but. Never mind. I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm not gonna simplify this for you, freaks. Um, people should be more careful. Be aware of your surroundings, and like you said, you treat t- typing in those codes like typing in the code at an ATM machine or even the self checkout at the uh, at the grocery store. Around here, they still have those things to type in the code. And there's a huge like rubber shield to try to make it so that the person behind you can't see you punching in the code. Mm. Do a mm-hmm. little of that with your phone. Yeah, I think. Well, and one of. Th- one of the other things to be really mindful of it here is especially in out in uh, social scenarios, kind of like Jake was describing, like the drunk idiots downtown at bars. Uh, one of maybe the most clever vectors of attack that people ought to be aware of is uh, what is one of the very few situations where you will willingly put your phone in the physical hands of somebody else. Like it's so that they can take a picture of you and like what group of mm. people out for a night on the town would say uh, no to, Hey, uh, looks like you guys are trying to take a picture. You want me to take it for you? And real quickly and real easily, they can uh, click buttons on an iPhone. Run away. I don't know if it works on an Android on an Android phone. No, even if it's locked and all you've got open is the camera, you can click buttons on it uh, and hold them for like just a second so that the next time that they pick up their phone, they will have to punch in their passcode and can't unlock it with face ID or touch ID. Ah, uh, yeah. And so you can It's like the triple them. click on the lock. Yeah. Yeah. It's the thing that everybody does when they get pulled over by the police so that they can't be forced to you know, have the phone waved in front of their face and involuntarily yeah. unlock their phone. Yeah. yeah. And so like be really mindful about putting your phone in other people's hands and once you do that like if you're going to have to type in your passcode first be suspicious of whoever it was that just you know took those pictures for you and then be really really clandestine about your inputting of your code it, it's just super important. <laughs> sure absolutely is another sort of best practice here that we're missing because I, I mean it, it is a pain i did this for a while i when i worked at a firm i had a work phone and i had a personal phone and i don't personally drink but if i was going to go out and be one of these aforementioned drunk idiots i wouldn't have taken the work phone with me i assume and I think my firm would have encouraged me to not do so. So for people who uh, are in professions where perhaps they're handling other people's information, like a lawyer, like an accountant, like something like that, um, is it worth it? Like, should that be the suggestion? Is just sort of you should ha- separate your devices? I mean, I, I, I see pros and cons. Like, as I'm saying it, I can see sort of pros and cons because, yeah, you may not take it out to the bar. And so you're not going to get targeted there. But the reason why you have the phone is so that you can access your work on the go. And so by definition, that phone is going to be on the go at some point. And so they're just going to target target you at lunch or at the Home Depot or wherever it is that you would take the phone. This sounds like a guy who owns Apple stock and wants everybody to have to buy two phones. <laughs> you, got the, you, got, you got your home phone, then right. you got your, your work phone. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I didn't have a choice. I, I, I didn't. I didn't have to buy it or anything. I mean, they, they just gave it to me. So I wouldn't pers- I didn't enjoy carrying two. It was in the like iPhone five era, so they were kind of chunky and they had those squared off edges. I didn't. I I wouldn't want to do it myself. But I, you know, maybe if I had, I don't have client information on my phone. If I did, maybe I would think about it. Yeah. 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 So speaking speaking of two factor, uh, sort of a, th- a thing I added to this was I don't know if you guys saw this. The other thing going around in the tech circles this week was partially sort of piggybacking on Twitter pushing uh, non Twitter blue, whatever the pro eight dollar a month thing is. All the non pro users have to use a third party application to generate their two factor codes. They can't use SMS codes, which is pref- preferable for a secure from a security standpoint, but is a pain for a lot of people. And so what this did was this pushed a lot of people, though, into the app stores to go looking for these um, code generators. You know, I, I talked before, a Google Authenticator is one. Authy is another. There's several that are like legitimate. There's one built into iOS, the latest version of iOS. And um, what people found is that the Apple App Store and I, I think the Google App Store as well. I'm sure the Google App Store as, as well. Yeah, is just replete with like scam apps, completely scam apps, like not just poorly made apps, but like this is not going to generate a code for you. This is going to steal your code. Or this is just going to mine Bitcoin or, or, or whatever. It's, but it's certainly not going to do what it says it's going to do. And the sort of the disconnect that people don't necessarily consider that, oh, no, you have to trust the application uh, uh, developer that is going to generate these codes mm-hmm. for you. Like we invite more and more people into our little uh, you know tr- circle of trust here when you hand the phone to somebody to take the picture, as Jason said, and then they can do some, you know, triple tap to make you have to enter the code and whack you over the head and take it. And then, um, <laughs> but also like with various applications that you make use of to do all these different things, you need to trust all of those as well. And we're just not necessarily being sufficiently skeptical. And by we, I mean like all tech users, but especially people who have other people's information on their phone are not being sufficiently skeptical uh, with inviting more people in to have access to their data. Right. Well, many of them don't do it. Yes, yes. (laughs) So they're all just named authenticator. So that when you search for authenticator, that's what's going to turn up. Or maybe they're not all named that, but a lot of them are named that. And then some of them that they were able to access the code to had like some of them that worked that they were able to sort of decompile and look at um, had aspects of the code that were questionable. Like maybe this is sending it someplace else when it's sending it to you as well. So it would function for you. You wouldn't immediately, it wouldn't immediately be a red flag when you went Mm. to try to use it. It just didn't do anything. But from what I could tell, the majority of them just didn't work, just didn't do the thing at all. And so the the problem there is maybe that's, if if it's not working to give you the code, maybe it's not stealing the code from you because maybe it just can't generate the code. They didn't even bother to like write that tooth, that, that, that aspect of the app. But it's doing something else, probably. And for the ones that are generating the code, it could very easily be also quickly sending the code off to some third party to attempt to make use of it. It would have to be a little bit of a spear phishing attack, I think. They'd have to be targeting you individually because if you wrote one of these applications, got it in the App Store, and a lot of people were downloading it, and you had it so that the codes would be sent to you at the same time, without that other information, the username and password, you wouldn't really have very much information. Like you wouldn't be able to do anything with that. You'd just be getting a continuous stream of these codes coming in that would kind of be meaningless for you because they'd be not connected to the accounts that they're tied to. You know what I mean? They wouldn't yeah. serve the purpose to to gain you access to anything. But from a spear phishing perspective, as with all these other things we've talked about with targeting people in a bar, that's great because if you can get if you can get a known target to download that application, you're done. That's it. Now you have access to their whole their whole life. Not good. Yeah. A thousand percent. Yeah. 
if you've got the time yeah. and the resources to go through apps that are submitted to the app store to make sure that they don't have any links in them to external pages, external payment pages, right. uh, to dodge or, the Apple you know, tax. Yeah. Right. Or to, uh, or to talk about the Apple terms and conditions and the limitations of the app store rules and guides, guidelines. Like if you've got the time to go through and, uh, comb through those apps to make sure that none of that stuff is in there. You have a, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, you have a moral obligation to uh, exercise at, at least that level of scrutiny when it comes to things that are going to have just very profound impacts on people's lives if they are allowed to sure. leak through here. Uh, you have people losing money, losing photos, uh, perhaps uh, lose, perhaps set, losing the privacy of confidential images or confidential documents. Sure. Like there's a lot, a lot of bad stuff that could happen. There's a moral obligation to exercise at least the same level of scrutiny that you do about things that end up with money in your pocket. Absolutely. And a lot of these applications in the article that we'll put in the show notes, um, charge a yearly subscription fee too. So these 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 fake authenticator applications actually get twenty bucks or forty bucks out of your pocket to begin with. Like before they even do anything else, they've already taken some money from you. And to, to your point, Jason, it is interesting that you know they did it all in the, the. I'm I'm not really beating up on Apple. I don't think the Apple App Store is any worse than the Google App Store or the Amazon App Store or any other. It's just the one I know. But um, they're all terrible, right? But it's. These application, these fake application developers had the uh, forethought to use the payment system that is approved by Apple, and so they got their applications that are complete scams approved. Like they, they, they abided by the rules that Apple actually enforces, and they skirted the rules, which is like actually being secure. That it seems Apple doesn't enforce at all, or even just doing what it says on the tin. I mean for the amount of money that uh, the app store brings in for Apple, I don't think that it's too much to ask that they ensure that the applications just even purely do what they say they do. Be, mm -hmm. You know, more so than even not being a scam. Like if it's an authenticator app, it should actually work as an authenticator because yeah, I don't use, I thought it was too. I think they were at one point. I mean, I, I, I think they were. And but it, it always seems to be like they come down hardest when it's just violating some rule that, you know, unfortunately seems to take money out of Apple's pocket. So like my bet is the reason why these authenticator apps go away is because Apple decides that third party authentication apps are not secure and you need to use the iOS built in uh, keychain and the authenticator in keychain. And so that's it. There's no more. Uh, you know, password managers, or there's no more, you know, no more of these code generating things. Like if it's going to go yeah. away, that's how it'll go away. Something like that. What seems to me, what seems a little bit more likely to me in this scenario is that it gets treated like maybe like CarPlay or something like that, where not every developer has the provisions that are necessary to develop a CarPlay app because of the sensitive things around, uh, you know, uh, using technology while you're driving around in a car and the potential for distraction. It's the same reason why you don't have uh, why you can't play solitaire or Sudoku on a car play app. Uh, and so there are special provisions that you have to ask Apple for and be granted. If you want to develop a car play app, I think similarly to get an authenticator app on the store, you should probably have to pass a higher level of scrutiny. I think that's probably not just true for authenticator apps. It's probably, it probably ought to be true for, uh, medical records, apps, uh, banking apps, banking. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so they've got the resources. Uh, if you need any uh, convincing that they have the resources to do this, just look at their most recent quarterly earnings report, which was down and yet like the most profitable corporation by a huge, huge margin. Uh, I think they've got a responsibility to do it. Uh, but until they exercise that responsibility, the way to make sure that if you go and get an authenticator app, which is a great idea, uh, if you don't want to use the one that's built into your operating system, uh, look very carefully when you're shopping in that app store, not just at the name of the app or the icon or the number of, uh, or the, like the star rating of the app, look at the developer 
of the app, you can click in on the Apple App Store. I assume you can do it on the Google Play Store uh, and any other Android App Store. Uh, look in there and see who the developer of the app is, and they will be credited with their other apps. And so if you want the Microsoft Authenticator mm. app, check and make sure that they're also the developer when you click on the de developer, that they're also the people who publish Microsoft Word and OneDrive and Outlook. And uh, similarly, Google puts out a great authenticator app that could be better in some ways, whatever. That this that's not the point of this argument or this discussion right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> They're much better. <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> they've really uh, improved if, on it. Yeah. If they also develop a an app that is you know for mining Bitcoin, or if they also develop an app that is for keeping your nudes super private, like maybe consider a different authenticator app, and also don't use that yeah. app to conceal your nudes. Right. If Microsoft is spelled with a K, that's a red flag. <laughs> yeah. Google with three O's, anything like that, that's no good. Um, to your point of, of, of the App Store making enough money, uh, $36.3 billion in app revenue in 2022. So yeah, I think they could maybe pop in there and make sure that some of these applications are, you know, they're all legitimate and they're not, uh, they're not fraud. It's not a financial problem. Yes. Yeah, I don't think you're the only one in yeah. general, but but here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was historically All right. In terms of follow up, um, I, th I think we can move on to that. We had a general. I popped this in because I thought it would just be a fun thing to kind of think about the different AI stuff we've talked about over the last, I don't know, probably all of the ten episodes that we've we've had. So we've actually published so far. We've talked about AI, but the <laughs> right. FTC put out a warning for people looking to make AI claims uh, about you know software products and stuff. And I, I, as I read these questions, I'm not saying to think about a certain service but uh, i can't help but think about a certain service and like it's not a bill of attainder because it's just like a, a warning memo or something but it's like a blog entry of attainder aimed at one certain uh, uh scion of a of a wealthy vc uh, family <laughs> um <laughs> yes yeah but so these are the things they ask you to consider before you make some claims um are you exaggerating what your product can do can do which i think you know, the thing we're imagining, yeah, a little bit, right? Are you promising that your AI product can do something better than a non-AI AI alternative? Yeah, I think that the, the speed and all those claims that they were making. More accurate. Did he? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Air, AirPods... Hmm. Okay. He didn't, maybe he didn't promise it. He just, he just said that, you know, it, he predicted it would be okay. Um, are you aware of the risks? I, that one, I don't know. That's coming to, that's getting to like state of mind. I don't think he was aware of the risks. I don't think he had any consideration of the risks when he made these claims. And then finally, my favorite one, which is, should be the first one and should be like the only one. Does the product product actually use AI at all? Right. <laughs> is my favorite because so many of these things, I think the answer is no. And I can't believe they have to say that, right? Like in order to be making these claims. But I mean, this is great to see the FTC. We talked about them with non-competes. We talked about them with um, uh, something. I don't remember. I don't know if you guys remember what the other big FTC movement was. Yes, yes, you're right. And looking mm. like, our, does anybody have example, you know, public and, and from the public, from advocates, from current tenants, past tenants, landlords, do you have examples of algorithms being used to mm. have discriminatory outcomes or impact or whatever the term is that would be there?
Ajá. Yeah. Hmm. Right. 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 They're, well, they're, this, they're sophisticated this, autocorrect. This FTC bulletin that they put out uh, where uh, Michael Atlison, uh, who's an attorney for the FTC, uh, he just kind of tackles that head on and, it, and near the start of the article, he just says, and what exactly is artificial intelligence anyway? And he just nails it like it's an ambiguous term with many possible definitions, uh, talking about a variety of technological tools and techniques. Uh, but mainly right now it's a marketing term. Uh, and, uh, one of the things that really stuck out to me in this, and I, I think puts, uh, an interesting little twist on it that is probably a a little dagger that's targeted at particular people. I don't know if it's targeted towards our good buddies that do not pay. Uh, but uh, were you guys on, on purpose trying not to say the name? <laughs> I, not really. Yeah, Joshua yeah, Browder. Okay. okay. Yeah, no, I didn't know I if we were doing a bit. I was just being I didn't like know if we were playfully coy. I was, no, yeah, yeah exactly. Did, yeah. You, did you say it three times like Beetlejuice, hoping that he would appear? Like, like okay, He's right I'm behind you now. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, but he notes in here, uh, like, does the product actually use AI at all? Does the product use AI at all? Or was the product generated using AI? And that immediately called to my mind, like, are we going to call everything AI because the product developer who was working on it decided to use uh, the GitHub Copilot on it? And like, oh, we used AI in the process of this. So this uh, technology, this, this software, this app, this service is powered by AI because we used uh, GitHub Copilot. Powered by AI. Yeah, yeah. Like, is that untrue that it's powered by AI? Uh, I don't know. It's a pretty big stretch. And uh, Michael Atlison is saying, like, maybe don't make that claim. That, that'd be a bad choice. There you go. So you could put that on your website. Yeah. I'm also powered by AI. No, I didn't. S- Sydney? Were you, you going to call her Brittany? What was that? You started to say B. <laughs> okay. I think Brittany would work too. Sydney or Brittany, either one. Somebody else should come out with a competing... Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. No, but I got access to the Notion AI. I got that email today. Everybody's coming out with AI. So, yeah, Notion apparently has an AI. I don't know if you guys have used Notion at all. It's like a note-taking app that does a gazillion other things. Oh, it's just a... Yeah, it's what... It's it's like no. Axia, kind of. It's a note-taking app. It's... it's, it's you a can knowledge use it as an outliner. App. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's a marketing yeah, term. Yeah, it's... Like AI. Yeah, it's the sort of thing where you put all your notes in it and you can like cross you can cross link between articles and uh you can yeah. throw in pictures and links. Exactly. Very similar. Yep. Yes. We're all chasing the Evernote dragon ever since. Yeah. Yeah. With the links between stuff and everything. People who are people <laughs> who are more organized than me, like can find a way to make use of these things. Same thing with like people who have their own wikis for all their like information the what would you say, Jason, information manager? Whatever people who can knowledge use those things, are, I think. Are knowledge management. There we go. Um, everybody has an AI now, and so I, I think we're hoping to at some point test this case text uh, AI thing because they apparently have partnered with, I think, OpenAI. Right, the AI for case text is OpenAI. That's exciting. So it says that, that they must have been that must have been in the works for some time. I, I assume since it came out uh, three days after OpenAI uh, made. The announcement that they had an API and it was available. So I guess this was, you know, in the works for a bit. Yeah.
Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You wouldn't trust. Yeah, you wouldn't trust a first year associate either, but you would ask them to, you know, go see what they could find and come and you would use something of it. You wouldn't just take whatever they wrote and sign your name on the bottom and go, there you go, done. And so it's the same thing. It gives you a starting point. It gives you a launching point. I see the value. Well, and I think about this. As, as you guys are talking about this, I think about it a lot like uh, like the autopilot, the auto steer uh, and adaptive cruise control on my car. Like the first, you know, 500 miles that I was driving my car, did I trust that? And heck no. Like I sat there with my hands on the wheel and like uh, very, very rigid attention on the road and like hovering there waiting to seize it at any moment. And now that I've got 45,000 miles on this car that and, uh, you know, a lot of that is covered with seat. autopilot, like. I'm not taking a nap in the back seat. I'm I'm obviously always watching because like I I've, I've monitored enough to monitored it enough to see like oh, I know that on this route that I traveled every day for 2 years, uh it likes to jerk to the right here to you know because it thinks that the lines are painted a little funny here and so like you will learn nice. where it kind of jerks off to the, sorry, that, <laughs> where it veers off to the side a little sure. bit, <laughs> uh, right. where it veers off to the side a little bit. Uh, so you'll learn that about uh, this uh, chat GPT powered case text thing. Jake, you're turning a little, a little bit red right now. <laughs> I probably am too. Uh, sorry, everybody. Sorry, no, dear listener. Uh, but uh, like I've learned that the autopilot, the auto steer and adaptive cruise control is like mostly trustworthy, but not all the way trustworthy. And so it'll do a lot of the work for me. Likewise, I think that so long as this product is what it is claiming to be, we'll get to a point where we will let it do a lot of the work. We'll get used to where it's going to have problems and need to be corrected. Uh, and then uh, we'll still maintain that baseline level of vigilance on it as well. And probably just have first year associates do the site checking and the shepherdizing. <laughs> what I wonder from a technical No, sorry, go ahead. Hmm. That's what I was gonna ask. Yeah, I wonder what the value add, like what has case text done on top of the open AI language model? Like, so they obviously they're not just using chat GPT. This isn't all because there's there's a whole bunch of different domains now have this uh, these partnerships, right? So case text is the one we know about. I know there's something for some sort of uh, medical records or something I was reading about. And there's several others of these, right? What I'm interested to see is like, what is the value add over chat GPT? Because we've talked about before, if you just go to chat GPT and you say, give me, uh, write me a 500 word memo outlining something and give me the citations, it just makes up cases where it doesn't have them. When I've tested it, 0% of the time, are they real cases? They're always made up cases. Um, yeah. What I wonder is what has case text done with the open AI, uh, uh, whatever that is, GPT-3, to make this more functional did they just aim it at their the cases that they have access to and if if so i would, I would expect like, can we expect it right i mean th that must be it i don't imagine they're getting in the weeds with the actual model they're just sort of saying go read all these cases and now be able to answer questions about them okay Oh, okay. That's interesting. In a closed universe. Yeah. That's very interesting.
Right. So there, there's an event. There's an <laughs> event coming up in five days. There's an event on March 7th, I think, uh, where they're going to do kind of an introduction. And I, I noticed that you can sign up for a demo, but there's only one time slot that's available. I wonder whether that's just like an omnibus uh, webinar that is going to be, you know, whatever 500 people mm-hmm. who are interested in it are all going to log into the same demo period. And uh, only the presenter is going to be able to talk. You won't be able to ask any questions or anything like that. But uh, we're going to have more to talk about uh, in this respect, I, uh, probably, uh, after they do the right. announcements <laughs> on, uh, what is that going to be, on Tuesday of next week? So I'm, I'm right eager now. to watch that. Yeah. Uh, hey, I made myself a calendar, uh, or I signed up for the calendar invite for it here. When is it? Yeah, it should be super interesting. The, the, I mean, that that model of just basically taking the language thing and the language model and aiming it at some knowledge database uh, and and seeing what you can get out of it is great. That's what I've been looking forward to. I hope to at some point, even just like a personal one that you have sort of running on your own computer at home that just to access all the files you have and just to sort of ask questions about when you sent an email. And, and I could totally see the value in that. And having something like this where it's targeted and the close that that closed universe thing to me is really interesting because that tells you that there is some uh there's some provenance to anything it says right you know they're not right. pulling this from some demand media um garbage uh you know ehow answer page or something it's being yeah, taken it, at least from it might be the wrong case but it's from a case it's the curated uh machine learning uh kind of diet of what gets fed into the machine learning processes is I don't know if it's curated. It's I don't think case text is curated quite the same way that, that like Westlaw uh, is curated with the head notes and all that stuff and Lexus and its analogs to it. Uh, but to be fed a steady diet of like actual case law, not whatever you know hogwash it finds out there on the sovereign citizen or AI blogs. generated stuff itself. Right. A lot of people talked about that concern, the AI being fed AI. This is the way to kind of uh, maybe not completely avoid it because you may have some decisions that, you know, some judge somewhere uses AI to generate or a clerk more, more, more accurately. Right. Um, But in general, you're going to carve out a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, The event is going to be presented by Jake Heller, who's the CEO of Case Text. It is confusingly uh, it's, it, so it's on March 7th. That's not the confusing part. It is at 9 a.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. I think probably they mean that backwards where it's 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. But I haven't talked to Jake not a great about start. that, so I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> maybe uh, hopefully their uh, co-counsel AI didn't write this press clipping mm. here. Well, that's true. Uh, we might be getting ready be for a it. big... I mean, these things have in the past. There's been some some you know big problems, right? The James Webb Telescope debacle with was that was that was Chat GPT, right? That was Bing, that wasn't it? All right. <laughs> oh, well, it's it's hurtling towards Earth, right? No, the question, right? Like, oh, it was Bard. You're right. I'm sorry. My apologies to Microsoft and Chat GPT. All right. Well, unless you guys have. <laughs> have anything else to talk about we can move on to what's going on and recommendations and stuff and uh what what do you got let's do it <laughs> oh no I do, but I didn't see this episode yet. But the fact that you're yeah. immediately recommending another show is disconcerting. Okay. Right. Uh, spectacle doesn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mm. You you want the spy thriller that's dressed up in in Star Wars skin. Mm. Mm. Intrigue. Cerebral. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You've burned out yeah. that part of your brain. It's it's just it's flooded with with dopamine at this point from all the Marvel movies, and now it does nothing for you. Like other people's joy. And that's why you don't care if they like the show or not. <laughs> yeah. Uh Okay, so what do you my got, recommendation Jason? for this week is uh, to consider, maybe not every time, but at least sometimes, writing out your oral argument that you're going to make in front of court or writing out <laughs> a presentation that you're about to give. Uh, Jake and I happen to be uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of strangely uh, tied together and working together on a particular case. Jake is sponsoring me uh, for my Pro Hoc Vice admission uh, to actually work this case that's in a state that's, that I'm not admitted in. But that Pro Hoc Vice admission had not gone all the way through yet uh, to the point where like, we had filed all the necessary paperwork. It should have gone through, but we just hadn't dotted the last I. Uh, and so we get to this hearing today and Jake is there to like be the local guy, the local counsel. Uh, and, uh, suddenly Jake has to make the whole argument. Thank you, God, that I wrote it out. Uh, and I texted mm. over to him immediately. Uh, so we did a, a fine little game of Cyrano de Bergerac, uh, today, but occasionally <laughs> think about writing out your arguments that you're going to make in court. That's a great, I mean, I, anytime I've tried to, I've had to make like some sort of public anything i've done i go into it thinking i'm going to do just that outline because like if, i don't know if you guys ever took like a speech class yeah. in in mm -hmm. law school or in college they always tell you don't read from a script because it's going to be too obvious and everybody's going to be able to tell and all you need is like you want to be you want to speak extemporaneously and you want like an outline or something that doesn't work for me you can write in a way that you can that when you read it it sounds like it's coming off the top of your head and if you're if you have any sort of brain cells to bump together in your head, you can throw in some ums and uhs to make it not sound like you're just, you know, reading off the page. Like there, there's ways to yeah. do this. It's you could go to acting school. Give it if a you cadence. Need to. There, there's ways. Yeah, you can give it a cadence. You can inflections. You could say um. You can all sorts of things you can do. Um, but yeah, I, I am with you. If you need to give some sort of public presentation, regardless of how well you think you know the material, some any kind of script is going to take you a long way. Well, this was done by this was done by telephone. So there's no like reading Still. faces and stuff. There was no like, right. oh, you can totally tell he's just looking down at a page the whole time. It was by telephone. So that that helped too. That's good. Right. Right. Mm hmm. Yep. Yep. You did you. you did justice to my words today, Jake. I'm proud of you. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh no.
<laughs> well, good work. I mean, consider that's not that's not writing easy. it down. Just yeah. consider write it down sometimes. <laughs> Okay, so comparatively, my my recommendation is nowhere near as intellectual as you know writing all of this, all of this sort of stuff. Um, it's just for like bad TV shows in general. I've been working through with my wife, har- like truly horrible uh, reality shows on Netflix, and the more strange they get, the better they are. And so the one we've been watching now, not strange in a, in like a you know lurid way or something, get your mind out of the gutter, but strange. <laughs> strange in just a, just an odd choice way. So the one we've been watching uh, lately is called Forged in Fire, Knife or Death. And I love any of these shows that like illuminate there. There's this like rich subculture that I didn't know existed. Like there's people <laughs> doing all sorts of things. They have some kind of hobby. They have something they're up to. In this case, it's people like making their own swords and knives and then filming themselves like hacking at milk jugs in the bare backyards in order to try to get on this show that I didn't even know existed. But then they come on and they have to go and like sort of like run this gauntlet mm. of all these challenges. You know, they got to chop it. One of the things is, which is just perfect. One of the challenges is they chop at these metal wind chimes with this knife that they've made. And it is just so insane. As you're watching it, you're, you're, you can't understand what you're watching. What, what kind of challenge is this? What world are we living in? But it's great. It's completely mindless. If you just sort of need to take your mind off of stuff, there's a lot of great reality shows on Netflix that don't have any of the drama that the others have and are just some guy wearing uh, a kilt. He claims it's a kilt. It's obviously a dress, uh, you know, running along, trying to chop through watermelons and pieces of meat with a knife he made out of a lawnmower blade. And that's not a bad way to end a night. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have watched it. That's fun. No, it's fun. (laughs) It's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I my my daughter loves it. Yeah. Yep. Good Your bad shows are yeah, they're completely get along. Yeah. They're completely escapist, right? There's no tie to reality. It's just it's just nothing. It's it's, you know, sugar water. No, I've not seen that. Hmm. (laughs) lots of good reality i'm I'm playing you off we have to make an imaginary only works once uh, engineer that i can blame for all of this like i'll I'll yell off off mic that you know ricky play play him out or we'll have ricky he's (laughs) he's handling all this not me Dang it, Ricky. <laughs>